Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Purple Stars podcast. I'm Sarah, your host, and we are so thrilled about today's guest. She has built a media empire, which includes a publishing company, a magazine, retreats, classes, multiple podcasts, and she is an author herself. But this being said, our guest is not just a successful businesswoman. She is someone you would love to be friends with. Her energy is positively contagious. She is so funny, brave, and truly authentic. Please welcome Sibby Owens. We're so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. Sibby, we read online that you were a very shy teenager. And we're so curious how your journey unfolded from being a shy teenager to being a, such a successful um, woman in an industry that asks you to let yourself be seen, to be vulnerable, and to share your voice. Excellent question. I was shy as a teenager, started particularly badly in, I would say, seventh grade or so. Whenever I was in groups, I would just clam up and could not talk. I could always talk to my good friends in smaller groups, but once I was with people I didn't really know, just forget it. The one thing I could always do, though, was write. And whatever was in my head, I could get on paper instantly. So it's not like I was clamming up and didn't have a million thoughts. I definitely did. So writing actually has been the thing that has helped me my entire life. So in a way, it doesn't surprise me that I would find myself in this industry and that I would still be writing to express the things in my head. I never could have imagined like doing it daily on Instagram or Substack or the way that like books, the way that life has, has unfolded. But I would say getting over my difficulty speaking when I was in particularly seventh, eighth, ninth grade, even 10th grade has helped me in terms of understanding conversation, observation. I've always been someone who scans the room before jumping in. You know, I, I have to assess before I, I join and I love photography. I love like looking on the outside in, even if it's just myself. So, so those skills I think have served me well. I think it actually helped. You mentioned connection to conversation and observation. You have done more than 1,600 podcast episodes, which we find very impressive. And could you share a little bit, what have you learned from all these episodes about meaningful conversation, connection, and maybe even listening? Sure. Yes. And I just wrote this article for Oprah Daily, which in and of itself was like so thrilling for me to have something published by Oprah, who's been obviously an idol for so long. But... I've learned a lot that has actually come very naturally to me. I've always been what people call a good listener because I really care about what people say. I never get tired of hearing people's stories. People say things like, make sure you pick an industry or whatever where you will never get tired of talking about a certain thing. And everything else, whether it's, I don't know, tennis or celebrity, all that stuff I could talk about in small doses, but learning about people and hearing a story from another person I, forever, that's endlessly fascinating to me. So a lot of the things I had to think critically about, what do I do when I listen? And what is it? Because like you probably, because you're obviously a great interviewer, I have this thing where people always just tell me stuff. And I have always been like that. And I think it's in part that I genuinely care and I listen. I pick up on what they say. I come back to the things they're talking about. I make it feel like a safe space by showing sort of care and warmth. And I try to like, this sounds ridiculous, but you know, a la 1980s Care Bears TV show where they had like things jutting from their chest. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but they would have all these superpowers and they would say like... <laughs> I don't know, superpower, whatever. And it would like be like a, a burst of light from their chest that would like shine across. Never mind, it doesn't make any sense. But I feel like I try to do that, like emanate so much that I care that it like comes from my chest outwards so that people can feel it as if it's a tangible thing. So I think I try to do that. But I also think there are some things that are non-negotiable. I have to be prepared. I have to have 
either read the book or skimmed the book or deeply analyzed an essay they wrote or know all about their career. So I have to go into it prepared and knowing what I want to talk about. And I don't usually have an end goal when I interview someone. I'm just curious about a bunch of different things. So being prepared, obviously, is important. Caring. Like, it's hard to do an interview with someone you don't care about. I, I think that would be very hard. And in my case, I'm so lucky because I choose my guests. Like, I'm assuming you choose your guests. I, I'm not working for a network that says you have to interview such and such a person. Like, I, I legitimately care. So that helps. And I, I think just giving people the space without always posing a question, just having a conversation makes people open up more than feeling like they're going through a laundry list of of someone else's questions, that it's so directed by someone else. Conversation is very fluid and people, you know, it goes back and forth. You ask questions, I ask questions, you just chit chat, you you leave a sentence open and people jump in. At first that made me really nervous. Like I'm going to just not ask a question. I'm just going to say something. Will they think that that's being selfish of me or what if they don't say anything? What if there's a long pause? But there isn't, There, there just usually isn't. I love how you say holding space for the other person. In our society, people get very uncomfortable with silence and stillness, Mm -hmm. if it's in the conversation with someone else or even with the conversation within themselves. And it's such a superpower, if I um, use your word from before, to have the courage to sit with the unknown, uh, not knowing what comes and what is the other person going to answer and Um, That actually is a perfect beginning for my next question. I would love to talk about the book that you published last year. It also refers to grief. I know from my own experience, both my personal grief, but also as a coach, people struggle a lot with holding space for grief, no matter if it's from someone else or their own. And I find it very interesting how a lot of people don't reach out because they are scared to say the wrong thing and they're scared to hold space for your emotions because they can't fix them. Mm -hmm. Is there something you would love to share when it comes to having the courage to hold grief, whether it's your own or someone else's? Oh, I, I like how you put that, that it's courageous. I think that until you go through it, you don't totally understand it. And once you do, then there's like this whole subculture of people who speak the same language and you can identify each other very easily. It's like this UV light (laughs) shining where like something suddenly comes out and there's a shorthand where you immediately understand. And part of that understanding is that you are not triggered when someone asks you about the person that you've lost. You're always thinking about that person or maybe not always, but it's usually, unless it's the immediate aftermath, which is still okay. But when somebody talks to me about someone I've lost, it makes me smile inside because I get to think about them and talk about them. It doesn't upset me. Like I think before I had lost anyone, I was so you know, walking on eggshells around people who had lost people. I didn't know what to say. I remember a f- girlfriend of mine, my Hebrew school, uh, her dad died in this very public plane crash and the Lockerbie plane crash or whatever. And I remember looking at her in class and she was just sitting there and I didn't know what to say. So I didn't say anything. And I regret that because had I just gone over there and like put my arm around her, just been like, I'm so sorry. This day must be so hard for you. Look, I'm here if you ever want to talk. That's all you have to say. And even seeing her now, I could say, I remember that time in Hebrew school, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, how do you feel about it now? Or So I think one thing with grief is just always knowing that you can never do anything wrong by bringing up the person who has departed. It's it's, you can't upset the person any more than they've been upset. And I think if you go at it from that point of view, there's nothing you can do wrong. I remember also I would like not know if I should go to a funeral or not. Well, I don't want to like overstep. Do they think I'm one of their close friends or not? Whatever. Just show up. I went to a funeral a year ago because I saw in the New York Times that the mom of a girl I went to preschool with had passed away. And I haven't seen the girl or her mom since I was like five years old, but I remember the mom so well. And I felt such affection for her from that time and the girl. And they were in all my photo albums. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go. I don't even have to say hi to anybody. You just show up. 
So I think showing up, not being afraid to insert yourself. I mean, I think one thing that is pretty universal is when you lose someone, you're often surprised by who shows up and who doesn't. It's like kind of similar to when you get divorced, by the way. But anyway, the people you might not expect are the ones who are sending you food and literally coming over with a thing of brownies that they've just baked or have a car waiting for you or just something. And you're like, wow, that is so nice of that person. And they're like these little, I mean, angels sound so hokey, but sometimes you're the one who's meant to be that person for someone else. And it's not because you're their best friend. It's just because that's the way it is. And I can't explain it. And I don't mean to sound woo woo, but different people show up for you. And sometimes you're the person to show up for someone else. And that's fine. And it's okay. And you're not overstepping and no one is judging you. And everybody in the throes of grief is just trying to put one foot in front of the other and just do what you can show up. Don't be afraid. Don't wait. Just jump in and and do. And they may or may not remember and that's okay. But that's your job is to be there and you'll feel good about it. And that's just the way it is. Showing up really is all it is about. It's not about the words or the actions. It's really about showing up. I remember my grandmother's funeral. There were so many people I've never seen, but I was so grateful for every single one of them. Mm-hmm. Obviously, none of them could take part of my pain away, but just knowing, wow, so many people loved Lola and all of them came here, feeling that care and that love, it just made that day a little brighter. I do need yes. to say, it made me feel like she's there, like her yes. energy is in the room. And yeah, my mantra, because although I wrote a book about grief, if someone that's close to me loses someone and I'm writing a card, I still am like, what to write? And then I always come up with my mantra. There are no wrong words. As long as I'm showing up, I'm mm-hmm. doing it. And that's all that matters. I I had that same thing literally today, as you referenced earlier. I don't know when this will come out, but we're recording this on 9-11, which, you know, I lost my best friend and college roommate on 9-11, and it changed my life in so many ways. I have a group text every year where we send notes to each other on 9-11, Stacey's best friend, her family, blah, blah, blah. And even today, when I was writing it, I was like sending you all love today. But then I was like, well, it's not just today, but you know, anyway, so I like paused as I was texting. And then I was like, don't be silly. Just like write. So it doesn't matter. Just send the heart emoji. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just you're thinking of them. So uh, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I, I, w- I would have thought, oh, I wrote an entire book about it. But sometimes what I do now, I open the page of the book. I'm like, okay, what could be the right paragraph for that person and then I intuitively open the book and then to see how I resonate with it. Wait, Sarah, tell me more about your book. Oh, this interview is about Zooks. I know. I know. But I want to I want to hear more about your book. Tell me more about it. Uh, my Lola, I call her Lola because she was Filipina. So my grandmother, she had cancer and I was traveling full time back then for, uh, as a coach for high performers around the world and it was before Christmas when we got the news that she had cancer and I called my clients and I said, I'm I'm not going to come back in January because my Lola has cancer. And the doctor said she's most likely to die within three to six months. Even if I'm a believer that everything can happen and there are miracles, but I I just can't come back. In case you are going to look for another coach, I totally understand. Well, none of them looked for a different coach, which was good as well. And my grandmother, the first round, she fully recovered. So she was, after six months, cancer-free. Afterwards, she lived 14 more months. And then she had a relapse and died within three months. And I promised my Lola to share our story so it can fill people part with hope and courage and love. It's a series of poems and letters about and to my Lola. I wrote about the emotions that I felt the most before her death and afterwards, and especially how my definition of happiness changed on that Mm. journey. How did it change? So before my Lola's death, I always thought, okay, a happy day. Obviously, I knew, you know, like yin and yang and day and night, like it's all part of it. 
But I always thought happiness is I wake up in the morning in a good mood. I'm in a good mood and lunch and laugh in the afternoon. I have a great meal. I shower and go to bed. Happy day. <laughs> and then after her death, I remember cried. I was angry in the afternoon. I smiled a little bit, but not much. But then in the evening, I had this sense of happiness inside of me. And I thought, oh, that is weird. Like, what, what, why? I couldn't understand. So I took a lot of time to think about it. And then I noticed happiness comes from holding space for all our emotions. It gives us the feeling of being home. Because when we don't hold space for emotions, we're always on the run. And the what? running could be working all the time, eating a lot, alcohol, drugs, could even be physically. Everyone has their way of running. So that's what the book is about, to give people also the courage to sit with their emotions and to also know that in the deepest pain, we can find gifts. I love that so much. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. What, so, was, uh, what was she like? My Lola, I, I actually have a picture like right next to the screen. She, she was a sunshine. She was and she still is. That's how I imagine it. So caring and loving and just so courageous. My Lola, she came from the Philippines in the 60s to the Netherlands. I met my granddad from Austria. And they fell in love. She moved to Austria to the countryside, like real countryside, without knowing anywhere German. And my Lola had a darker skin. And she would first one there so it was you can imagine in the 60s and she was the first foreign nurse sure. and my little it happened that a lot of filipino nurses came there and are still there these were all the people coming to the funeral as well so yeah very courageous similar to you i i actually need to share why i contacted you for the interview so i was in santa monica and one thing that really was missing our bookstores. It's just, I'm used to, from London and Vienna and everywhere. It's just small independent bookstores where you feel the soul of the books. And I was like, wow, we have everything green chooses, yoga, pilates, and holistic massage, but we don't have a bookstore. And I really felt my soul was lo longing for that. Then I saw the big, like, the, the store wasn't open yet, but there was the big sign. We are opening, I think it was mid-February called all my friends. I said, oh my God, can you mention on Montana the bookstore is opening? I'm just so excited. I must say, I had no idea prior who you were. So I just went, oh, someone is really cool opening up a bookstore. And I walked into just before I flew out to London again, and your team told me you have a podcast. And I was like, oh, how cool. I'm sure they thought she has no idea who Sydney is. But I literally, I had no idea. Then I looked at your podcast and I thought, wow, she's someone I would love to be friends with. Because one thing that really stands out on social media, when I look at your Instagram accounts, you're so authentic. So authentic. And you don't pretend to be able to juggle all the balls all the time to be perfect. And I just thought, wow, I want her on my podcast, whatever my podcast is going to be. And it was still all in, in the making then. Which brings me to the next question. I saw you have a rescue dog. And I thought, absolutely perfect. I'm going to send her an email. So could you tell us a little bit about your rescue dog, please? Well, okay. So first, so my my husband's, and by the way, your Lola sounds amazing. And what a yep. gift that you are honoring her in this way. And you know, I don't know what you believe, but I kind of believe deep down that they kind of know I when they're being, so. when they're being, you know, uplifted. And I bet that would make her very happy. When my husband's mother died of COVID at age 63, two years ago, three years ago, we inherited her dog, Naya, who was literally around here somewhere. And I, of course, completely fell in love with Naya, who's a black lab and the sweetest creature on earth seriously and from the moment I basically fell in love with her I've been like worried about her dying because it's like every time I'm like I can't live without her I love her so much but of course 
we know that the lifespan of a dog is what it is, even though I like to spend disbelief and pretend that she'll be around forever. When I went on Good Morning America for my memoir bookends, which came out last year, there was a dog rescue thing set up in the next room. And I went in and there was this tiny little black lab, or I thought it was all lab. It actually turned out, it turned out not to be, but and I picked up this dog and I was so nervous, right? My book was coming out. I couldn't sleep for weeks, blah, blah, blah. And my life's dream of having a memoir and blah, blah, blah. And I just held this dog to my chest. And it, like, I forgot, they were like, aren't you supposed to be going on now? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Because it was just so, I don't know. I felt like the dog was put there for a reason. And I called my husband. I was like, let's do it. And we didn't put any thought into it. It was like one of these, impulsive decisions. And then when I went on live a minute later, they announced to the world that we were adopting the dog. And I hadn't even like really thought about it. I haven't talked to my kids about it. Like my, my daughter was sitting on the couch watching being like, what? But what ended up happening, we did rescue the dog and we brought her home. We had her for about a week and it became clear that she would need a level of attention and care that we couldn't give with a dog and four kids the craziness of our life and everything like that and living in New York City. So I ended up giving her to my very best friend who lives on, like with chickens and dogs and cats. And she has like a whole menagerie. And she fell in love with who we called Papaya. She renamed Stevie. And actually, my best friend ended up having this really uh, terrible traumatic brain injury this year where she was doing the TRX machine at the gym and it fell out of the ceiling and she fell and hit her head. And it turned out that the dog, Stevie, is the one who was able to help her through that whole thing. And she could go on walks because Stevie would lead her around and help her not to fall and help her find her way. And even now her husband has COVID and Stevie is like keeping her husband company. And I just believe that the dog wasn't meant for me, but I was meant to help it find its home. <laughs> so I'm like a messenger of the dog and that it found its, its rightful owners. Wow. I always believe dogs find us. Sometimes it's through another person. And it's, yeah. it, it, it's beautiful. What an amazing gift for your friendship as well. That you found her guardian angel on four legs. Yeah. It's amazing. And what did you learn from the time with that beautiful rescue dog? Oh, I learned not to bite off more than I can chew <laughs> But also learned, I mean, it brought out the best in all of us. I mean, my my son, who is now 16, slept with the dog two nights in a row when Papaya was around. And it, it brought out, I got to see sides of all the people in our family that really highlighted all of their strengths, all of their love and caring. You know, ultimately, P Naya was so scared of Papaya and our real allegiance is to Naya. So, it's also, you know, it, it taught me you can only take on so much and, you know, but also the, I went to the dog shelter and I mean, it's enough to make anybody just sit down and sob all day long. I wanted to rescue all the dogs. I posted on Instagram while I was there. I was like, oh my gosh, you all have to come to the shelter and like get a dog. Like, <laughs> you know, just take these dogs, give them homes. But I also, on the flip side, know how hard it is to turn your your home and family upside down but I don't know I man dogs to me are they're not just pets you know they're there's they're like people so yeah they're family and it's as a coach I find it so interesting how much we can learn from them this mm -hmm. being able to speak with like human words mm -hmm. and wow dogs they really have it figured out whether it's taking care of themselves resting enough play and with rescue dogs what what inspires me the most is they've gone for a lot of trauma but over time they still manage to open their heart again and to trust mm -hmm. I, I always think there are so many people that have been for trauma and throughout their entire life they keep you know their walls and guards up and dogs naturally still trust again and mm -hmm. I, I find it so inspiring for how to heal from trauma, especially on an emotional level. Tell me your rescue dog story. So I, I fostered a dog for, it was just for a week. It was very spontaneous. I went to Whole Foods. I didn't even plan to. 
fault for the whole thing. But I felt this pull to keep walking a little bit long further. It was a motato. Mm-hmm. And it was it's just a little piece of grass. And there were tons of dogs. Then I saw Simba and he looked at me and I felt how to say, please take me with you. So I took him with me. It was, it was just so funny. They said he was potty trained. The first thing he did, he pooped on the new carpet. He peed on the floor. And one thing I really learned is you need to have time when you get a foster yeah, dog, yes. a dog, especially since they are so sensitive. And you really need to know when how to tell them off and how to set boundaries without feeding into their trauma, but actually helping them to trust their new home. And you need to have the mental, emotional, and physical space to be very present with them because otherwise it's di- difficult to read why is the dog reacting like this now or differently. And I cried so much when I gave him back because I had to travel back to Europe and I I took him out all day long because I wanted to make sure everyone sees the cuteness of him and adopts him. I talked to everyone and said, isn't he so cute? Do you want to adopt a dog? I've never talked to that many strangers like in those few days when he went back. Fortunately, he didn't have to go to a shelter. And then he was adopted after three weeks. So oh, I good. see my little bit similar to your situation. I helped him to trust again mm-hmm. and to there is love out there and it can be saved. That's wonderful. I love that. One more thing I want to ask because I know you're very busy, so you will um, be leaving soon. You're, pu- um, you're publishing another book. Uh, can you share whatever you are allowed or ready to share a little bit to tell us what we can expect? Sure. So my novel, it's my debut novel. It's coming out March 1st, 2024, and it's called Blank. It takes place over six days in Los Angeles in places you will definitely recognize. And it's about a wife, mother, and daughter, and best-selling author who is under deadline for her second book, which has proven to be quite difficult. And the deadline unleashes a series of events that she never could have seen coming that involve her career, but also her children. Basically what happens is her son over dinner, she has all this writer's block for her second book after her first one was such a success. And her son says, well, why don't you hand it in blank? And she thinks, oh my gosh, that's genius. I'll hand it in blank. And it'll be a commentary on the publishing industry that it almost doesn't matter what's in the book. It's how you market it and what people talk about. So part of it is some light satire, but the heart of the book is about this woman's marriage and her motherhood and what it means to find happiness in middle age and beyond. And how much is the inspiration coming from your own life? Well, you know, I did change my life significantly at 40. And I think I'm drawn to stories where people rewrite their stories themselves and it's never too late. So that piece of it for sure comes from my own life. But none of the details. You said about finding happiness in the middle age is there something you can reveal like does the definition of happiness change interesting for your earlier comments on happiness i think that often we feel stuck or we feel that we're on a path and it's too late to shift and so you make do but there's some piece of yourself that you keep silencing over and over again. And maybe it's so silent, you barely even hear it. But when you stop, you know it's still there calling out and telling you that there's something wrong about this picture. And you can ignore it and just go on. But if you listen and you let that voice get louder and then loud enough to take action so that you can find the meaning in your life and what you're supposed to be doing, what you're supposed to be feeling, if you can get a little bit closer to that and feel like what you're doing and who you're with and your daily life is is more aligned with who you really are and want to be, then I think you will find happiness. What do you suggest for people on their day-to-day like busy lives, how they can noise cancel a little bit the distractions? Mm-hmm. 
outside. So their inner voice and inner guidance gets a little louder. Yeah, I think they should write, whether it's a diary, a journal, something for themselves. I think they should, if they're interested in writing, at least, you know, take a class, do a workshop, not for the class itself, but just for the assignments, which for people who thrive with accountability, like I do, really make you do the work. They could go to therapy, which is also really helpful, but writing is free and always available. You don't need an appointment. You don't need anything other than, you know, your fingertips and a keyboard or a pencil and paper to somehow unlock what's really in there. Because at least for me, when I sit down and start writing, it shows up, it announces itself because it's actually there waiting for the right channel to come out. So if you can get in touch with what you're actually thinking and feeling through writing, I think you'll have a good shot at hearing that voice. And it doesn't have to be for long. It could be five minutes. It could be while you're waiting online. It could be one time I even tried like talking out loud, but it doesn't work as well for me. But I was like, maybe if I talk on this, hike, I'll get through it. But I, I think that you need to spend a couple minutes when you could be on your phone or scrolling or whatever. Everyone has a couple minutes. Pretend you're writing a grocery list. For me, it comes out pretty quickly. And or for other people, it might be a different way. Going to coffee with a girlfriend. You know, I rarely make time for that anymore. But anytime I do, I'm like, oh, my gosh, look at what that brought about. So um, coffee with a girlfriend, therapy, writing, all those times, you know, a workshop, an online forum that you're like, I can't believe I'm signing up for this. But who knows? So, you know, for Zivi Media, the media company I started, our tagline is, who knows where the next chapter will take you? And I, I really believe that in so many ways. We, we don't know. It is not all written. Life, as we know, can change on a dime in a bad way, but it can also change in a good way. I'm sure people, especially when they're starting with the inner journey, they will have one or the other inspiration trying that because it is really about getting to know yourself know what works, when to have inner work by yourself, when joined with someone else, when is it nature, when is it writing, when is it breathing. I always say like throughout life, we get the toolbox and then we know, okay, do we need this today or do we need the mm -hmm. other? It's it's really about getting to know yourself and writing definitely is, is a big thing. I remember I started writing with Julia Cameron's morning pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many years ago, and I remember she said, write three pages. I bought a very small notebook because I'm like, how the hell am I going to feel three pages? I bought a small one. Right. And the first sentence I wrote was, I feel so stupid. I have no idea what to write about. And then I filled the pages like even more. It is just about getting over the first hurdle of doing it. And you mm -hmm. said, for you, it comes quickly. And I'm a big believer. It's practice. Mm -hmm. the Often we do it. It's a muscle that we practice. And our subconscious mind knows, okay, piece of paper and pen. We're now looking within. We're slowing down. It is a safe space. It just to build that it, um, those associations and build those bridges. And it, it takes a little bit of time, but the more often we do it, the quicker we get it to that mode to noise cancel the outside and just mm -hmm. to hear more what's on the inside. So. I would love to finish our conversation with three dog-related questions. Okay. The, the first one is, if you could ask your pet the question, what would it be? I'm tempted to say, do you really like that food? Because it does not look very good to me. <laughs> That's kind of what I, I... I would also want to say, like, does this life bore you? Like, are you bored? Like, where do you really want to go? Like, do you, does this bother you that you have to just follow us around all the time? I don't know. I'd want to know all that. I love, I, I love that, especially with the food. Then the second one is, have you ever caught your pet doing something embarrassing when they thought no one was watching? Mm -hmm. Naya tends to do that licking, cleaning of herself, like in big group settings. Like my whole team will be meeting and she'll jump on the couch and just like go at it. And I'm like, oh my God, please stop. Not right now. <laughs> 
But she's the other way around. She likes for that people to see. Yeah, I guess so. Exhibitionist over here. Then the last question. If your pet could write a book about your life together, <laughs> what you see secret would he or she actually, in that case, reveal? My pet wrote a book about my life. Secrets. I don't know. I guess that my husband and I fight more than maybe people think because I snap a lot when I'm stressed, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, that I, I snap a lot when I get stressed and I get really impatient. And uh, yeah, she sees that. Your answer is just another reflection of what I said in the beginning. You're someone people would love to be friends with Aww. because are truly authentic. And how many people needed to hear that right now? Because they see you caring and loving and, and like listening and being patient. And then you reveal that you do snap as well and you do get angry. And it's, it, it is, I'm sure there are many people out there, especially women that have to juggle being a mother, being a wife, being an entrepreneur and all sorts of hats they need to wear throughout the day to hear, oh, she's a human as well. Like I can give myself the permission and it, to do the same. And it's not a big deal. Yeah, um, I try to work on it. I don't even know what that means, <laughs> but I'm not proud of it. <laughs> yeah. I hope you liked the conversation and it sounded engaging that I might get another interview with you one day and then we'll definitely catch up on that. I'm just so grateful with everything happening in your life that you took the time to share with us your journey and to give us a glimpse into your lessons and how you manage things in life. I'm sure people loved the talk as much as we did and thank you so much for your time you're so welcome you're really great at this keep it up thank you it's a wrap for today's episode thanks everyone for tuning in and if you loved the conversation with Sibi as much as we did please share it with your friends and family and don't forget to tag both Sibi and us to keep the conversation going and we can't wait to have you back for next week's episode <laughs>